Hey guys, and we are live. Uh, this is uh, OMG. Welcome to a new episode of uh, our new show, which is actually only new from this year. It's the 12th episode, and today on the show, uh, I have the pleasure to receive uh, two guests. Um, we have uh, Angel. Uh, I don't know if it's on the right or on the left for you guys, but Angel uh, Sack, who's from uh, Mores Inside. Hey, Angel, how's, you doing? how's it going? Thanks a lot for having me. And we also have uh, Alex uh, from France. Uh, Alex, who is a game developer in life. Hey, Alex. Hello. So Alex has a very poor internet connection and Angel on the other side has a really great one. So don't be surprised <laughs> if we have some kind of a non-equal discussion at some point here, but it's uh, it should be quite fun, I think. Um, so if you guys are following us uh, on the live stream, don't hesitate to write down your questions on the chat. Uh, we may not have the time to go through all of them uh, if there are many of them uh, throughout the show, but what we'll do is that uh, towards the end, we'll go quickly over it and pick a few of the most interesting one and try to give an answer to it. Uh, so the purpose of today's show is to talk about VR uh, and uh, mostly to um, take a look at the state of VR today after so many years uh, where we have been hearing about VR, burning millions and billions of dollars to try to build some cool VR experiences and still after five to six years now, uh, Still, I mean, how many of your friends do have a VR headset at home? Question mark. Uh, not that many. I had one uh, which was not mine. It was at the office and it was up on the shelf for over three years. We almost never used it. Um, and uh, I have my insights on this and I'm sure both of my guests here uh, will also have some insights. But before we dive into it and to frame this uh, discussion around VR, uh, I will ask um, each of them to introduce themselves. So let's start with Anshul first. Uh, you, uh, what are you doing in life and how does that relate to VR uh, for today's discussion? So in life, I'm a uh, technology industry analyst. Um, and basically in my role, I cover the technology industry and the majority of the trends that occur within it. And my areas of coverage are um, PCs, smartphones, but I also cover AR, VR, as well as 5G. So I actually cover a lot of stuff, um, and I spend a lot of time traveling around the world chasing uh, different conferences, product announcements, and meeting with different companies uh, that work in those spaces. And I've been covering AR and VR uh, since before I was an analyst, which started in 2014. Um, but I actually started covering it uh, in 2013, if not earlier. Okay, so you've been around VR for a very long time and you probably <laughs> saw all the the background stories as well, as well from the manufacturer side and probably from the, the media and the consumer side uh, So because you also attended some of the launch events. Uh, so that's going to be very interesting for the next uh, the rest of the discussion uh now you alex uh, which uh, is reducing in size it's, it's quite funny uh so alex uh, please introduce man. yourself <laughs> uh yes so uh, i'm alex friend and uh, as said uh, timothy i'm uh, a game developer so i mainly make games uh but for i'm um, i'm actually a developer so i work on a lot of projects not only games um, I, I used to do a lot of uh, business development, um, but I also make games and now I'm mainly focusing on uh, creating VR apps. Um, so I, I do a lot of stuff about uh, developing and I, and I also uh, do some, uh, some teachings uh, in schools, like in Belcourt Ecole, for example, uh, where I try to teach uh, some uh, newcomers uh, how to create games and how to, to program at least. Uh, in order to, to create prototypes or, or such. Okay, so you have also an experience on the education side uh, as well, which would be quite interesting because probably some of your students are uh, of the newer generations of uh, programmers and also probably of gamers as well. So their expectations should be quite different uh, and it must be quite funny, I think, sometimes to uh, to have them go through some uh, coding exercise, which they probably think it's... Uh, <laughs> not, not always I, up to I, speed. <laughs> I don't fully understand them uh, sometimes. Uh, they, they have some uh, millennials. <laughs> crazy things. Yes, that's that's right. Yeah. That's different. So. Okay. All right. So to um, to give a bit of uh, an introduction of um, of VR itself, VR is nothing really new, and there has been uh, many many headsets. I think the oldest one that we probably all remember uh, is the one from Nintendo from a very long time ago. 
uh, used to be uh, super clunky. You had to hold it with your hands. It was not really a headset, to, so to say. It was mounted on your head. Um, and we've seen an evolution of hardware through time. So we had uh, those handheld headsets at the start, which almost had to be held on the table because they were so heavy and big. Uh, it was kind of like holding a monitor to your face. Uh, and then it went from headset to that. And now what we can see today is that basically... Um, most of those headsets are becoming wireless. Uh, so Ansho, maybe you can run us uh, through uh, from your perspective on what were the major evolutions within VR uh, over the past years. Let's say from when Oculus started investing a lot in it, we had HTC and what happened after that? Sure, so I think a lot of people's attention to the VR industry started when Facebook bought Oculus for $2 billion. Um, that kind of started this gold rush of um, investors. Um, pretty much everybody in the IT industry wanted to get involved in VR in one way or another. Um, a lot of them didn't really understand how they how they could get involved or why they should get involved. Um, and a lot of them were investing in companies without fully comprehending the size of the market and fully comprehending the time it would take to actually deliver a mature mainstream VR market. So a lot of these people were putting these valuations on the market that were unrealistic, which I will say I called them out in the beginning. Um, some people listened to me, um, others did not. Um, but the reality is every single new platform, be it VR, be it AR, be it smartphones, you name it, everything takes about a decade. So um, to, to, you know, think that AR and VR were going to be a $150 billion market in less than eight years was just insane. And that's what people were saying. And I was trying to say, you know, first of all, it's going to take at least 10 years and I don't think it's going to be $150 billion. So cool your jets. And, um, I was going out and calling out all these big investment banks um, and all these different, you know, venture capitalists and all these different firms. And, you know, I saw it as a public service, um, as well as something that I was just doing because I thought they were wrong. Um, and, and now, you know, everybody had to tamper down their expectations because they were unrealistic. And, and part of it was, is that people were doing this because they had to justify the investment that they were making in VR, um, or justify the investments that they had already made. Um, and, and basically explain away why they threw, you know, a hundred million dollars at this company that won't be able to realize it in 10 years. Um, and will probably take another $500 million of funding to finally reach their product. So, you know, there, there was a lot of, um, irrational exuberance as there usually is with any new industry. Um, you're seeing a lot of that with AI now. Um, you know, there's like 19 AI chip companies out there and, two thirds of them will fail. Um, so like, you know, people are gonna invest money and there's gonna be a lot of money lost. Um, but with VR, you know, there's a lot of really good bright spots. Um, and there's also some places where things don't look so great. So um, that's, I think, normal with any, you know, growing new industry. I still consider VR a new industry uh, because, you know, there's so many startups still in the space but if you look at, you know, um, the industry today, a lot of the mature players treat AR and VR um, very similarly um, because there's a lot of similarities in how the hardware and the platforms have to be built. But obviously there's differences in how content is created. And um, I think that if you look at the industry, a lot of people are accepting that the difference between AR and VR is actually gonna be very small in terms of how it's delivered, but the content will still have to be aware of what's what. And um, yeah, it's it's really, really interesting because um, what I've seen in the industry is that we've transitioned from an, ir an irrational approach to um, trying to adopt a consumer first approach. And now everybody's realizing, oh shit, like actually enterprise is a much better place to start. <laughs> and that's where I can make money now and oh these businesses are willing to spend a lot of money because vr applications are actually saving them even more money than they're spending and right. that's ultimately 
who really wants to adopt this technology first. And shocker, that's exactly what happened with PCs and smartphones. Okay, so so basically, it's quite interesting, uh, like you mentioned, that um, so all those billions that have been invested um, are going to take years, uh, even still from now, to bring anything back, if not ever bring any of the money back that has been invested. Um, so what we see also is that, like you mentioned, there are basically two applications: there's the professional one and the gaming one. And I was browsing some of the website of the different brands that are doing VR headsets today. And you can clearly see it if you go on the Oculus side, for instance. Uh, well, basically, there's no mention of business at all. It's all about gaming. So the first image is someone playing a game. And then when you basically scroll down on the page, uh, basically what, what you see there is basically just just more games. So you have, a, you have the specs, obviously, and then you have the list of all the games that those guys have, which is, uh, you know, it's interesting, but <laughs> it's like it's not business at all. Uh, then no. You, when you look then for for HTC, it's kind of like the same thing, but HTC broke it down in three pieces. You have the gamer, the professional, and the enterprise. And actually, I think the professional they mean like more the creators, which will be people doing mm -hmm. music, people doing a graphical work or design or I don't know applications like basically what you could do with the Nvidia Hololens stuff. Uh, and then you have HP, uh, which would you you don't you don't really know where what's the target for those ones. It's like uh, the images are very stock footage. You don't know if people are gaming or if they are doing professional work. It's not very defined. Um, and so it keeps going the list. It's the same for Lenovo. Uh, it's not super precise what it's about, uh, even tourism in some ways. Uh, mm -hmm. So here we are no more talking about, you know, consumer experiences, which have nothing to do with either gaming and professional use case. Uh, and then we have the Samsung Gear or the Gear VR, which is uh, something I think that's kind of like abandoned nowadays. Uh, I don't yeah, see anything dead. about it anymore. So As far <laughs> as everybody's concerned, it's dead. <laughs> so, so, so basically, uh, billions of dollars, uh, multiple use case, and like you mentioned, probably the one that would make the money fastest would be professional usage, uh, and this translated into uh, most likely quite some waste in time spent, uh, I think, by developers to create content, because in the end, uh, if we've been sold on VR or something for gaming at the start, uh, what happens is that a lot of uh, developers ended up building games. Uh, straight from the start, which were basically and not ended up being the, the target audience, but just because no pri prices were too high, whatever. And even now, I think what is it? PSVR is it still the the most sold VR headset? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So it's only for PlayStation. So if you were making games for PC, yes. then <laughs> oops. <laughs> uh, so so you it's can't use it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite difficult. So Alex, uh, you that build games for VR, that build some applications for it. Uh, is this something you notice as well? Uh, yes. Um, so as Angel said uh, earlier, um, when the the Oculus Rift uh, Kickstarter uh, was um, the most overwhelming thing of, of the year, uh, it started some kind of uh, of a gold rush, let's say. Um, so everyone was uh, so hyped about uh, what uh, VR could bring to the gaming, to, to everything. It was uh, the, the new revolution. Um, and they started uh, to, to make some kind of uh, uh, a war between all the big industries uh, trying to get their headsets uh, before everyone else. Um, so if you remember, the, the, the H HTC Vive uh, was out before the actual final version of the Rift. So as you can see, HTC got, uh, got uh, very high on speed uh, in order to get on the market first. Uh, but in the end, um, it, it doesn't really make a difference because um, um, I say, I, I think we have um, passed the, the first step about um, getting things uh, working. Um, the idea of virtual re re reality is not uh, really um, new. Uh, it's here for a very, very long time, as you said in the introduction. Uh, but uh, it needed a, a very uh, expensive stuff in order to make it working. And it was even uh, not really uh, that good. And by uh, bringing back this idea, uh, we, we got uh, a new uh, wave of hope, let's say, that uh, we can have with the actual uh, technology um, some kind of answers to, uh, to make um, virtual re reality actually work. So we had this kind of period 
um, since the, the Oculus Rift uh, went out, uh, when uh, where all the uh, constructors uh, kind of uh, gathered all the, the technology parts, put them together and made it work. So I guess this is the first part. And at this point, um, I think everyone thought that um, all people in the earth uh, would buy this and just buy uh, a crazy uh, PC in order to make those uh, those uh, games or apps work. Uh, but they didn't because it was just too expensive. <laughs> Uh, you had to buy uh, a headset for uh, 700 bucks and then buy a PC ga a gamer PC for 200, maybe 300. No way. You, you, you have um, some people that did it because they have money and they want this. It's their passion or, or, or such. Yeah, the but early adopters. It was, <laughs> that's it. But it was clearly, clearly not uh, for everyone. And, I think that uh, at this point, um, people like investors or everyone that put money in, in this uh, kind of uh, projects uh, didn't really realize how much uh, money it just costs in order to, to have uh, an actual working uh, VR ready station. Um, and for a lot of time, um, it, it was just too expensive for uh, like uh, uh, your, your neighbor uh, that uh, is just uh, playing games. Uh, for, for fun to in order to, to just get it yeah. it was like, just too expensive actually yeah if we if we looked at for example um, I remember back in the days if you if you look like the the typical steam player uh, PC you know from the steam statistics most people had a 580 GTX or something like that but for VR you needed a 1080 Ti or something like that which still nowadays is a card that costs more than six hundred dollars uh, which is probably about uh, three fourth of the price of a Actually, right now you, you can you can play VR games. Uh, I'd say not at the maximum uh, specs, but you can play VR games with uh, um, far lesser cards. Uh, for example, I have a nine uh, um, nine seventy GTX, and I, I can also uh, play games and create contents uh, in my PC. So uh, I bought this card like uh, two hundred bucks. So it's not really that uh, that costly right now. Right. Of course, if you want to, to, to play some uh, advanced games and have a beautiful graphics in VR, of course, you will need the best uh, card on the market. But right now, you don't have to to, to get uh, the top of the game uh, of the, the uh, CG cards in order to, right. to use this kind of content, which makes it uh, more affordable for, uh, for people. But still more expensive than PSVR. Yeah. Well, yes. By far. Well, Yeah, well, the interesting part is um, PSVR is actually not that cheap either, right? Because you have a $400 console and you've got maybe a two, dollars $300 headset. So you're still looking at a considerable amount of money for most consumers. Um, and, and part of the thing is, is that if you look at um, the newest hardware, like the uh, Oculus Quest I have right now, yep. um, this is $400 and... It's everything. It's this this is a game changer. Yeah, so this this is why, first of all, it's why I have it, right? Because I need to. But also, if you look at it, like, the headset has the same controllers as the PC version of the Oculus Rift now. Right. So the Oculus Rift, um, the new one, the Rift S, has inside-out tracking like this, slightly modified version. So you don't need they, extra, care, like, a box no, in the room? No, it's, all, you, it's yeah. all in here. And same with the PC version. So they're simplifying it and removing they have cables. The same, <laughs> yeah, and they have the same controller scheme. So right. when a developer designs their game, they can design to both um, headsets, obviously with different performance profiles. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, those headsets are a $400. That's it. You're done. There's nothing more you have to spend. The onboarding process is less than five minutes. Um, yeah, there's no the calibration and putting no, no, stuff. No, no, no. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a five-minute process. You put your controller down. You create a little walk-around area if that's what you want. And what's even crazier is every time you get in VR, you pick up the headset, you put it on. It says, okay, you're in the right room. Walk into your VR zone. You walk in and VR pops up and that's it. It's like a 10-second process. So, so and that's a huge problem for VR. It's just, you know, turn on the PC, 
update your drivers, launch the application, um, you know, be it Steam VR or whatever. It's and basically the, the, the console versus PC debate. Yeah. Well, even though consoles also, have been updating, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be discussed. Just, <laughs> the, quest, the quest is kind yeah. of this, the, the, the golden, um, you know, the golden option, the golden right. um, lamb that everyone's been trying to achieve, right? Because it's what everybody's always wanted from VR. And once you use it, you're like, yep, that's it. That's pretty much it. Because it, the quality is there, the performance is there, the user interaction's there, built-in audio, headphone jack if you want it, 128 gig storage, it streams. Hell, it has built-in Chromecast, so you can Chromecast what's in the headset to a screen somewhere else in the room. Uh, that's pretty cool. So actually, so talking about those uh, hardware evolutions, it's also, I think, maybe what slowed down VR also for many years because there was so much different hardware and none of it was really cross compatible. I think Alex, maybe on the dev side, you can tell us more about that. But like basically everyone has their own SDK. They were maybe not all interchangeable, especially at the start. Uh, some things were working on one, but not on the other. How, how was that for, for dev? I mean, it must have been night, like the nightmare. Uh, yes, four letters, <laughs> hell. <laughs> um, yes, uh, each each uh, each uh, headset maker uh, just wanted to, to create their own, uh, so they created their own uh, SDK, uh, which was uh, not really well integrated on, uh, in the, the game engines. So basically, you want you want to create a, a game or a content in uh, in Unity or Unreal, you have to get the the proper SDK to to make your game around it. And then you want to, let's say you start on making a game for Oculus, and then you want to, to put it on the, uh, for work on uh, the HTC Vive, for example. Uh, you have to import the HTC Vive SDK, change all the game so it just works, and then put it on the, the shelf. It's mainly just recreating uh, a whole part of your game. Uh, so yeah, it's really time consuming. Um, sometimes the SDK are not even uh, made to work with uh, each other. So you have uh, some kind of conflicts, which is painful. Um, and and yeah, it was kind of uh, complicated in order to, to create a game and then publish it on uh, for multiple uh, headsets. Is that still a problem even, today? Uh, even now, it's still some kind of problem because uh, you don't really have some kind of unified uh, framework in order to, to work with uh, each, uh, each headset. Um, I work mainly with Unity, which is uh, doing a great job at um, easing this, uh, this part. Um, uh, in the beginning, you had to, to implement uh, your own way of uh, viewing cameras because when you are in VR, you have two cameras rendered one for the left eye, one for the right eyes. And so the cameras are just uh, making um, a specific angle. So your eyes are actually seeing what, uh, the, what you would see in this virtual world. And in the beginning, you had absolutely nothing. You had, you had to put the cameras yourself in order to make them work. And the funny part about this is uh, if you just get something wrong, you're just going to be sick. And that was the, I'd say, fun part of uh, creating <laughs> VR, <laughs> VR apps. A, a lot the of beginning. developer puke. <laughs> the first uh, yes. <laughs> I think I spent more time uh, just recovering from being sick than from uh, actually making uh, things with uh, VR. Uh, so this, uh, this time is uh, far gone. Uh, but right now, um, in, in Unity, they, they created some kind of uh, a groundwork in order to, to make uh, an abstraction from uh, which headset you are using. So you can start using this and uh, you only have a little part of, uh, of um, communication layer in order to, to make this uh, unified. Uh... Uh oh. Oh no! Well, the, the interesting thing yep. was um, uh, on that topic. Oh, we got him back. Oh, Alex, you're back. We missed yes. the end of your sentence. Yes. Uh, so yes, I, I was saying that um, it helps right now because you just have to to write the the, the connection between the actual uh, Unity layer and the specific headset uh, SDK. So it gets uh, less time in order to make a, a game or app uh, working on different uh, different platforms. 
Well, Oops. I did. But this so time, the game engines are doing it now. And is it less time means less, less money, or is it the same amount of money because you can make greed and stuff? <laughs> um, I, I'd say you you, you can uh, use this time uh, to, to do uh, more useful things, uh, yeah. more uh, creative things uh, in order to, to, to get better games, better apps, or maybe make more apps. Uh, so you don't have to, to bother uh, doing uh, some technical stuff that uh, no one will see because uh, it's just uh, under the hood. <laughs> and it's harder to justify uh, why did you spend so many yes. hours uh, making it work <laughs> it only looks like this <laughs> yes okay uh yes. so so question for you also alex uh, so we talked earlier about the the two the business model basically either um what i would say b2b so basically uh, application for companies uh, anything that is uh, ar or vr uh, basically any kind of something that uh, designed to help people working in a certain application learn things or um, basically learn to use specific machines and tools and things like that so in a professional environment and then there's the b2c side which is usually more gaming and uh, experiences maybe like we saw earlier with the tourism stuff uh, for, for you on the on the business side is uh, did you notice this as well is it something where you can say already today that there's definitely way more uh, business to be done uh, with B2B or is there still gaming applications that are still worth pursuing or is it not worth it? Well, about, about gaming, I think it's uh, it's still a little bit early in order to, to get uh, really big productions um, because uh, creating games costs, costs a lot, a shitload of money, <laughs> let's be honest. Uh, and right now, I don't think there is uh, enough players in order to absorb uh, those kind of costs. Uh, however, I think we, we can still create some kind of uh, great games today, uh, but with uh, a smaller scale for now, like uh, Robo Recall. Um, it's a short game, but this game is just great. It's, made, it's meant for VR, it works just perfectly, the game is fun, it's very interesting, uh, so this kind of uh, products work. Uh, but in order to get a uh, more very advanced game like uh, GTA or uh, Red Dead Redemption or this kind of, uh, I'd say, level game, uh, I think um, we'll have to wait maybe five or ten years in order to have really a, 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 a good enough um, a player base. Uh, which have the actual uh, hardware in order to play those games. Uh, for this to be to be to be financially um, um, sustainable. However, uh, for the the more uh, B2B um, part, uh, there is a lot lot of needs. And uh, since the the main problem is money, because this kind of hardware costs a lot of money. Um, they they are more um, inclined to to get things uh, or make things in in VR and right now the most used uh, most new, uh, most used case of uh, VR in uh, in business is for learning purpose because uh, it just works very well uh, it has a lot a lot of benefits first uh, since you are uh, really engaged in the experience uh, you will remember a lot more things from uh, what you experienced, uh, which means uh, the actual uh, enterprise needs less uh, time in order to, to train uh, new employees. It needs less um, money, it costs less money, etc. So it's really interesting for this part. Uh, the second one is that uh, since uh, once you created the, uh, the training application, you don't need to uh, gather uh, someone that knows how it works in order to train new people. You just have to put them the, the headsets, they will follow the, the experience, they will learn stuff, you can make some kind of uh, questions afterward to, to, to check that they, they, they really learned uh, what, uh, what they, they should be learning, and, and that's all. So it's really um, interesting for, for, for this point. So it may be um, a high um, investment at first, because it will mostly cost a lot more of money than just picking someone from your uh, from your industry and just uh, making him um, teach something to a bunch of people but in the long game um, people just uh, remember uh, very well what they learned into the vr space so on the long run it's really um, 
I'd say, uh, an advantage for uh, for people to use this kind of technology. And as I could saw uh, from uh, from my perspective, uh, people in the industry are um, starting to understand how powerful uh, VR is. And not only for games, like it's uh, advertised right now, but also for uh, more uh, technical and industrial um, uses like this. So for training, so let's say you want to um, learn how to use a big machinery. Um, for example, on uh, you are becoming a mechanic for uh, for big uh, big, sh um, big ships. You can't have, uh, let's say, a training engine for uh, for this uh, in your backyard because 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 there is two engines of this kind on the world. Yeah. yeah. So what can you do? You 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 just can't. It's just physically not possible. Another example for uh, for EDF, which is uh, uh, an electric company in France, um, they need to to train people to to make uh, reparations on um, high uh, high powered line. Th this is uh, a place where if you just make a mistake, you can just get knocked out and just die because it's very dangerous situations. So by using VR, you can recreate this kind of, uh, of, um, of setups without uh, having to put people uh, in danger because they just don't know how uh, they're supposed to, to do things. So uh, there is a lot of, uh, of really interesting, um, interesting use. Uh, for uh, another example, in, um, in, uh, in medicine, uh, some um, some people who are trained with and without uh, the use of VR, um, some surgeon, and uh, the fact is that uh, a surgeon that was that were trained with uh, VR headsets uh, made uh, less mistakes. They were faster than the others, and uh, so uh, the, it just works. <laughs> <laughs> it just works. <laughs> it just works. <laughs> to to not take uh, some famous and, words. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the, the fun part uh, with it is that uh, we, we are not really sure actually right now why it, it works. Uh, so um, people are, are actually making some research about this um, on the cognitive part to to really understand uh, why why it works. So if it works uh, so, so well, we we should expect it to also be rolled out in schools, I suppose, because. I mean, a lot of the teachings in school is wasted because people don't pay attention, I suppose, or they don't get it because it's so abstract from reality, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. Uh, I mean, even me for math at school or stuff like that, or even like more, you know, more high level topics, you just don't get it because you don't see it in front of you. It doesn't mean anything. You're talking about, you know, formulas and things or mm -hmm. even stuff you need to do uh, when it's a practical case. And if you don't do it by yourself or even even if you could click it, it would still be better than, I think, just talking about it on paper. Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sure at some point we will see uh, some kind of new tele technologies like this, uh, like VR or, or even uh, AR in, in schools because uh, it truly really helps um, understanding and actually um, living uh, some some experiences that you you wouldn't uh, be able to live uh, without getting in danger or because it's just not possible uh, right. ima imagine uh, putting a vr headset on a, on a, a student to teach him uh, what it's about to to see earth from the the international station you, you can't physically do this but yeah. with uh, vr headset uh, you can so uh, i'm sure you know, at some point we will see uh, this kind of headsets in schools um, not not right now uh, i think it will take a lot of time uh, because uh, it still uh, costs a lot of money and i think we won't uh, we won't see this kind of technologies in, in schools or even in um, in um, in the hospitals uh, between before uh, a lot of time uh, because we still need to to uh, scientifically prove why it's working and uh, what are the upsides and what are the downsides and this takes a lot a lot of time so um, there there is already um, some specific uses of uh, VR in um, in um, in healthcare. Uh, for example, uh, I saw an example um, an example of use for people that were uh, burnt. Uh, so they are basically burnt everywhere on uh, two or third degree. So it's very very painful. And um, the the problem with, with uh, this kind of uh, patients is that they 
they are they are always in pain so uh, they are always using uh, some uh, kind of morphine or things like that uh, and it's not good for the, the the body so they try to create some some experiences in vr uh, where uh, they are put in some kind of uh, mini train and they are moving around um, very slowly in uh, a place covered with snow and the idea by that is just to putting them even just virtually in a place where it's just cold it's just cold and just by uh, making them feel that uh, they are in a, a cold space um, it eases their pain just because uh, it's come it's kind of uh, cooled down their their body it's like and manipulating uh, their mind just with vision that's right yeah actually yes there's, so there's a works. lot of that happening in healthcare it's cool. So, Ansher, for you, from all the customers you speak to, is that also something you notice? Which, which are the which are the customer base that basically has the most demand? So, there's the dangerous jobs, and there's, I guess, the jobs where you need to teach a lot of people because just turnover may be super high, and it makes also sense to just go faster. Which, yeah. which is which the biggest? So, right now, I'm seeing there's a lot, an absolutely massive amount being used for training. Um, and, and the reason why, and actually the, the HP reverb headset, uh, which I also have, um, you have them all <laughs> $600, right. which is actually quite cheap. Um, and this also adopts a lot of the, um, you know, quick in, like this only has two plugs. It's pre-installed all the drivers and windows, plug it in and go. Is that the and one day demo also with the backpack stuff? Yeah, this connects. Yeah. So if you notice the cable in this is actually really short, right? And that's because um, they shorten this connector so that you can actually get a short cable that connects to the backpack, um, which also comes with the headset. So you can have a long cable, which is what I have down here. It's like 10 feet long. And then you have the short cable, which is connects to the backpack, which is a whole different story. That's more about engineering um, and training on device. So, um, yeah, uh, honestly, uh, I'm getting a little bit side, side, you know, um, a tangential, but the thing is, is that training is huge. Um, Walmart bought 17,000 Oculus Go's uh, to do training in store. Um, uh, at CES this year, the HTC booth was all about enterprise training. I've learned how to fly an F-18 fighter jet. I learned how to manipulate a forklift. Uh, and I also learned how to do uh, public speaking. So, you know, the enterprise use cases are almost limitless. Also, I, last year I learned how to put out a fire. Like, the truth is, there's so many different simulations for enterprise. And really, the, the, the big idea to hit home here is enterprise VR applications for training work because it allows you to put the user in a scenario that would otherwise be impossible because those scenarios happen very rarely and are very dangerous. And if you're able to train somebody how to deal with that scenario without actually putting them in it, you save tons of money on personnel, equipment, training, and insurance. Because, so, you know, if you have people immersion. are properly trained. Yeah, it's all about immersion. And, okay. and, and, and honestly, training is number one. Um, Education is growing every day. The problem with education is right now, most of these VR headsets are... The research is saying that you shouldn't be putting a child under the age of 13 in there because their eyes are still growing and still maturing. And that's the biggest hurdle that I see for education right now because I think for $400, the Oculus Quest is the best thing for education. Um, it's cheaper than an iPad at this point, and a lot of schools have iPads now. So I think I think you can deploy you know, 10 Oculus or 20 Oculus Quests in a room they have, you know, the right management software now. Um, you know, the teacher can control the content on there. It's a very closed system, which is what you want for so a school. It's built for education, basically. Yeah, honestly, yeah. I think it's built for a lot of stuff, because, um, you know, a lot of these location-based VR places right now, they're using a VR backpack with a VR headset. But the reality is, they want to use a Quest. And at Oculus Connect last year. Oculus showed off the ability to use an Oculus Go, uh, Oculus Quest, in a location-based environment with, you know, five people on each team, and it's like, well, well, you don't need a PC for that, right? And those things last a few hours, and you just 
keep cycling through headsets while while they're charging. So, um, you know, location-based VR is going to be a big opportunity as well. It's already quite large. There's hundreds of locations around the world. Stuff like the Void is a big deal. Um, you know, doing the whole Star Wars VR experience. I have yet to talk to somebody who went through that and didn't love it. Um, so the, the reality is location-based VR is a big deal. That's a great opportunity for, you know, B to B to C, right? Because you're selling to the business and the business selling to the consumer. And then you have the, the enterprise stuff, which is just blowing up. Um, and I caught that trend like two years ago, thank God to SIGGRAPH. Um, and the reality is like um, enterprise is really what's leading the charge and that's normal and it's not a big deal. Um, the one thing I was gonna address earlier you guys were talking about is the marketing. Um, HP and HTC's marketing is very enterprise focused. Um, I can agree that it does you know, need a little bit of refinement, um, but Oculus is absolutely 100% still focused on consumer and it's because they have very deep pockets, right? They don't have to sell headsets. They to want to make it work business. for gamers. That's their target. Well, I think they want to make it work for the biggest group of people possible, right. which happen to be gamers. And they, they want to own the platform that people come to when they're a developer and they want to make money on a VR title. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's also a, a very big um, interconnection with Facebook uh, because because uh, all yeah. the all the ecosystem around the Oculus Rift or the Quest, the S, um, all those uh, headsets are very connected to Facebook. Like uh, when you create an Oculus account, uh, it just imports your Facebook friends. <laughs> yes. No choice. <laughs> <laughs> really, no choice. Uh, you, you just can't. Um, and so I, I think there, there are uh, some kind of betting on uh, the fact that uh, the people that are using the headsets uh, will uh, some kind of uh, talk about it on Facebook. Right. And uh, I think they can use the, this kind this uh, leverage in order to, to get even more and more people into their platform instead of the others and, uh, and um, to, um, um, put the attention on the, the kind of community part. Like you can uh, have a, a chat with a friend in VR and you will see its avatar and he will see yours. You can see, um, check, create some kind of um, uh, connections and uh, community uh, um, based um, activities. Okay. Well, yeah, it's quite interesting because I saw, um, last time I saw Oculus was at PAX. So PAX is a big uh, gaming convention. And uh, in east uh, on the east side, so in Boston and west side in Seattle, and they have some other ones also in Australia, etc. Uh, and Oculus had the, probably the biggest booth at the show. It was super massive, and they had all those rooms where people could try out um, game titles, um, basically. And uh, you could see that, yeah, they they're totally going for for that market. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. They're also sort of subsidizing the price of their headsets because i mean right mm -hmm. now they seem to have the the best tech for it as well and also they are not among the most expensive ones at all so they're definitely making all they can to drop the price as low as possible um interestingly one of the players that we didn't really see into the the space is microsoft uh angel did you see anything on the microsoft side in terms of like uh, not just hardware, but maybe more working on VR applications because Microsoft is someone you would expect on the B2B side for sure. Um, and I think I haven't seen anything really that much, you know, B2B and learning and all that focus from them. Um, they focus a lot on the hardware with the Surface and they have all those things. Uh, they have even those big PCs, you know, with the wheels for creators and stuff like that. But for VR, um, there hasn't been any showcase yet. So... The way Microsoft approached VR um, is more of a um, VR and AR approach. So the HP headset that I have, this Reverb, yeah. uh, is actually running on Windows Mixed Reality. Okay. So it's it's using these inside cameras on the front to do the mapping um, and map out the environment around you so you don't need lighthouses. And then it has these controllers, which I also have. Um, these are actually Microsoft's controllers. Oh, they design these, um, and basically it, it track. They work a lot like the um, the Rift controllers do, but the cameras and the headset track the lights on these controllers, and that's how it tracks the location of these controllers. 
Obviously, that's not as good as using lighthouses in terms of accuracy and latency. And if you put your controllers back here, you might lose tracking. Um, but it works in 90%, 95% of use cases. And basically, their contribution was the platform. And they created the reference design. So the first generation of, of Lenovo, um, first generation of HP, first generation of Acer, all their headsets were actually Windows Mixed Reality headsets, okay. which were essentially their take on Microsoft's reference design. And now yes. we're getting these second generation devices like this Reverb. Um, so I think they've contributed a lot. Um, it's just they haven't taken a as prominent a role as some other competitors have, but then they went out and built the HoloLens and then yeah. HoloLens 2, which works on the same platform. So, you know, they're taking a holistic approach that, that, that kind of incorporates both AR and VR and doesn't give one precedence, yep. um, but they built their own AR headset and the HoloLens 2 is awesome. And um, it's not a VR headset, but it you know it's probably the best AR headset I've tried to date. It has hand tracking, eye tracking, iris authentication, all these cool things that you should really have in an AR or VR headset. And um, yeah, I think we're really starting to see this you know 1.5 or 2.0 gen of VR headsets, yeah. and um, it's just beginning, right? You know we have the Valve uh, Index coming that's been announced and now you can pre-order it. So it's all, which done. is also like wireless. You don't need a PC for it. Um, well, you don't need, no, you, well, no, <laughs> you, you, you stream from all... your PC basically. Yeah. No, it's still, it's still the vibe. The valve index is still wired. Oh, it's still wired. Um, yeah. Okay. I thought and, it wasn't. Okay. My bad. No, it's still wired and uh, it still has lighthouses, but everything's upgraded. Field of view is upgraded, has outward looking AR cameras. Um, you know, improved audio. They did. They 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 really upped it up the ante. But I will say, I was a little disappointed they didn't up the resolution, even though they increased the field of view significantly, um, which I think will affect image quality. Uh, this thing right over here is actually running. Uh, the sorry, the reverb is running 2K by 2K per eye, so it's actually running over 4K resolution, um, right. which, which is, is the highest resolution VR headset. It's higher than the uh, Quest, right? Oh, it is. This quest I'm seeing here, it's 1440 yeah. by 1600 per eye. Yeah, this has more than that per eye. That's so it's insane. like, yeah, so it's got really high resolution. Um, the only headset that's higher than that is a professional VR headset, um, which is the, um, well, actually, there's a couple, actually. So there's... Um, Star VR or something like that? Oh, the, the one that VR, looks like is, the, yeah, this crazy... Yeah, so Star <laughs> VR is... I want to mention Star VR, but we're still not sure what's going to happen with it's that. It's not retail, really, right? It's no, concept. it's actually quite good. No, 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 no. It, really? That thing Cause... was ready to ship. Um, they had it at um, was it SIGGRAPH? They had it SIGGRAPH. They they did their launch at SIGGRAPH, and right. it was ready. Honestly, the last version I tried was almost ready to ship, but they're having some internal. Um, right. So they're financial... not they're not really selling it. No, unfortunately moment, yeah. not. I think Acer's going to take it on and sell it. But it's a great headset. Um, that one was 5K resolution. Um, and then there's like a um, VR Engineers has one. Um, that's also 5K resolution. Uh, there's the Pimax, which is claiming 8K. Um, but in terms of image quality, the Star VR was really good. 210 degree field of view, which is insane. Yeah, um, pretty insane. <laughs> but it looks great. So it's kind of um, like having an IMAX around your head, basically. Yeah, and it's glorious, honestly. Yeah. It, it was amazing. And then um, you also have um, the 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 guys from Finland, the um, VR1. They're called Vargo, and they um, they have two displays um, per eye. So they have a like a like a 1440p resolution, and then they have a smaller like ultra high density micro display inside. That's the XR one, which is the upgraded version of the VR one with outside viewing so you can see your hands. I see, yeah. Which is one of the main issues with VR in general, especially when you're looking down to your controllers. You see the controllers because they're added into the digital yeah. version, but you don't see your fingers around it, which is yeah, kind of so useless. The, the, <laughs> the XR one, they just announced at Augmented World Expo last week. Yep. And the XR one is basically the ability to do AR using their really high resolution VR headset. And that's the thing, like some of these headsets, 
they have the ability to do AR and VR because they have cameras already. So it's like, you know, the, the lines are blurring. They're blurring right. very quickly, and we're really losing this sense of what's AR and VR. And it's kind of like, you know, some companies are using MR, some companies are using PR. It's like, okay, that's why people use XR, because it's like... Right. Which is so everything together, connects. basically. Yeah, yeah, it's just, XR is just everything. So that's where it's basically going to go. So the tech went from something that was not even handheld to the headset with wires to a PC, which used to be needed to be super powerful, now a lot less. Uh, now we we also, we lost sort of like the, those towers that you needed to have for tracking, which mm -hmm. never thing is into the headset. We are losing the PC completely because it's now all computed straight in the headset, which I mean, because in the end it's not nothing different than a smartphone driving it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the thing is we are adding cameras back so we can see things. So basically the idea is that you don't need to remove your headset to see what's happening around you in real. Exactly. Um, and then mapping eventually real, uh, basically digital stuff on top of the real, real environment. Yep. Um, okay. Well, so, so basically that's, that's where it's going. What would be the logical next step after that? Um, so the logical next step would be basically creating, and I think Oculus is already kind of previewing this. Um, they, with the Quest, uh, when you put the headset on, you don't immediately go into VR. It actually puts you into uh, AR, which is kind of gives you like a little camera view of your world, the real world, and it shows you the um, holodeck-like um, environment that you've created with the yep. mapping that you mapped out, and you can walk towards this virtual space, and once your head passes the wall that you've created virtually in, in, in mixed reality or augmented reality, then you enter VR. So the idea is kind of this, you know, you choose, do you want to be in AR? Do you want to be in VR? So you can create a space in your living room or in your home or in VR, and you can be in AR in other places around the home. So I think the future is no XR, no AR, no VR. It'll just be a, uh, you know, a spatial computing headset or a mixed reality headset where yes. you you pick the environment you want to be in, and the content will follow that. I see. Oh, that's and, a. And I think. Yep. I ahead. think Microsoft made a great move about this uh, because, uh, as we talked uh, earlier, um, Microsoft is not, is not really present in, in terms of uh, hardware uh, in the VR space, uh, but they create some kind. They created some kind of. Um, um, it's not a, a way of thinking about uh, merging uh, the VR and the AR uh, stuff in something uh, that we call today the MR, the Mixed re Reality. And I, I, I also think that uh, it's the next uh, the next step to not to have uh, VR on one part and AR on the other, but to have um, devices that can manage both and to give the, the users, the players, or uh, anyone that will use this kind of, uh, of hardware, the ability to use both. Um, for example, you have a PC, you can uh, work with it, you can also play with, uh, games, you can watch movies, you can do a lot of things. And I think the next generation of uh, headsets will provide this kind of uh, possibilities. Uh, you will have a lot more of um, of controls, like for the the eyesight. You will be um, the headset will be able to to catch the the, the sight. Uh, more controls about the the controllers. Let's say for the the um, the fingers. Uh, the the last Vive um, headsets can or controllers can um, detect where are your uh, your fingers on the on the controller, which is pretty fun to watch. Um, so I think we'll get a, uh, more, uh, each time we'll get more and more and more uh, some kind of features that will be able to, to, to enhance the, the global, um, global experience. Okay. Do we actually still are going to have controllers at all? Um, I, I, from my opinion, I think the way it's going to be is um, you're going to have, you should have, actually the way it should already be, but you know, technology and cost. But I think hand tracking should be a base level interaction for every Minority headset. reports. Yeah, so like, 
the way I look at it is, for example, the Quest still requires controllers, right? I can't actually use this without controllers. So the idea of if I leave my controllers at home, can't do I anything can't with it. it. You cannot right. even uh, enter so, uh, a video to watch it. So basically. that that headset back there requires a controller, and I've forgotten it a couple of times because it's tiny. So like, yes. I can't use the headset. So in my in my mind, minimum level there needs to be a base level of hand interaction and hand tracking, and just so that you can use it without controller. And then when you want to do like refined stuff or you want to do gaming, then you don't want to like constantly wave around with your hands and do it. You want to have a controller. You can sit down and kind of just relax a little bit and, and press buttons or whatever. And if you want to be precise, like, you know, um, Logitech just came out with a, uh, a VR stylus. So like a tool, like a, which yeah, exactly. could be like a dedicated tool to even as something you're learning specifically, a, exactly. screw, a screwdriver or something, you know. <laughs> exactly. And you don't want to, you know, mimic a, screw, a screwdriver, right? You want to have a screwdriver in your hand and turn it and twist it. So there's going to be, I think, Hand tracking is absolutely going to have to be a minimum spec in my mind. But at the same time, we're still going to use controllers because we still use mice and keyboards. And, um, you know, we still drive our cars with a steering wheel, even though the thing is 100 years old. So yeah. some interfaces will continue to exist. But I think hand tracking, um, voice control, um, and eye tracking will actually be a big deal as well. Because to um, enter I menus still... and navigate, because I mean, yeah, like. If you played any VR game nowadays, navigation is terrible. Like uh, I think last VR game I actually really tried to play was the Skyrim VR, which is Skyrim just kind of ported oh, for VR, but it's kind of like Skyrim it's terrible. VR is a bad example. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's it. It's it's a, it's, it's, it's a good example VR, of what's badly done. It's like yeah. you, you, <laughs> yes. you, the controller is it's terrible. You want to navigate in menu, you have to scroll like this, and it's like what the heck is going the, on here? <laughs> the controls are bad because the game wasn't uh, meant for yes. VR. They, they just got their the game and ported the, it to, to work on VR, but it's it's it just don't, doesn't work. They could have just the redone the menu. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah. No, but that's it. Yeah, you do need uh, to have a proper command over the over it, so it makes sense. And which is, yeah. I think it's so far, it's still kind of like a bit a bit behind. Even if you have adapted games for VR stuff, it's still kind of like a bit clunky in yeah. some cases. And I mean, I'm not a developer. Alex is, but you know, I've seen so many VR titles out there, and I'm the one thing I can tell you is ports just don't feel right they have to be built from the ground up for vr and Absolutely. and like you can i can you know if you show me a vr title i can tell you it's a port in 60 seconds yes just just, the, just the menu tell. just the opening menu <laughs> you can just tell it's just it's, it's just just not the too same. obvious obvious yeah you, you you can feel it in 10 seconds and like if you try um this title on oculus quest is called vader immortal that was done by ILM X Labs, which is like actual part of Disney. That that shit's unbelievable. Like you put people in there and like, what? This is all running in the headset? Are you kidding me? Like they're just blown away. You you turn on the lightsaber, you can feel the vibration in your hand, and the nice. light comes out and it like reflects perfectly, and you're like, oh my god, like <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And it's like running on a Snapdragon 835, which is the same processor as runs in the pixel 2 yeah so like there's so much more runway we have left but you know we've had to hold back because hardware was moving too fast and developers couldn't you know develop to a certain spec and now that we're you know kind of we've cemented this snapdragon 835 is this you know target for mobile standalone vr because the the um the Google Daydream, the the um, Lenovo Mirage Solo runs on Google Daydream, same processor. Quest, same processor. Uh, HTC um, Vive um, mobile headset, also same processor. So we're we're kind of coalescing around a standard hardware spec in terms of performance. So once we've done that, you know, more developers can start building to it, and I really think the Quest is going to be a huge deal. And it's just, you know, the Go was kind of a teaser and the Quest is really what's going to be awesome because it's going to be capable of doing so much more and it'll feel like you're running on a PC. And I've tried some titles that are also available on PC, like, like you know, um, Super Hot. 
and it's almost impossible to tell that it's a different platform. Yeah. It, it, it feels the same. And obviously it's a low poly game, but I mean, that's part of the point, right? You want to build a title that can be ported easily from platform to platform so consumers can enjoy it regardless of which one they're on. And as a developer, you can, you know, monetize. Yeah, which is the most important part, I guess, to make it yeah. sustainable anyway. It's no more about uh, making a game that is uh, more beautiful than the previous one. It's more about uh, getting a real grasp of what you can really do in VR and to immerse your players into your, your game. You can create a game that is in low poly, that is completely not realistic. Like Minecraft. You, you, like Minecraft. But if you, if you create a game that really makes the player feel that it's really parts of the game and not just a player uh, seeing the game through its, its screen, um, you you can just um, forget um, things completely from a game uh, that are not um, really useful and the player will still really enjoy his experience. And that's the real point about uh, creating VR games and that's why um, porting games uh, actual games in VR doesn't really work it's because the core gameplay mechanics are not based around the fact that you can have hands around picking things and so on so this is a very important point and once uh, this specific part uh, will be at least uh, understood by most uh, game developers uh, people that will create games in VR will create incredible games like Beat Saber for example Okay, so, so, so I, have simple, a, yeah. it works. I have a question for you, Alex. So since you're also involved in, into teaching as well, um, for a lot of things, uh, I had some chats recently with completely other applications, but um, to be able to do something great with something new, um, sometimes you have to unlearn what you've learned. So you have to unlearn the way you were building games before uh, in, in a desktop environments uh, to to be able to learn to make games or experiences for VR, for instance. Um, I, I wonder actually in education, are there already some uh, university or some classes, parkours, where it's all about just creating VR content and VR experiences, if that's where most likely the, the future is going to be for uh, education or even for, for gaming or whatever. Um, would it be would there be already something in place where basically uh, new students are being taught right away from the start which are the values of making a great VR game versus a PC game? Uh, I think it's a little bit uh, soon for this uh, since uh, we don't uh, have uh, enough players we can't create big titles so we don't need a lot of people that are uh, like uh, have a skill in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of field so eventually uh, I'm sure we'll see some uh, VR specific uh, game design courses uh, in order to create uh, games that really fit the, the platform uh, but for now uh, I think it's just too it's just too soon so um, it's um, the the um, the global rules of uh, game design uh, can stay the same. Uh, you can start from um, an idea of a game, refine it, uh, get uh, a game design of it, and you can uh, create a mobile game out of uh, the mecha game mechanics. So you, you will uh, stick to the simplest uh, integration possible. You can create, uh, let's say, uh, a PC game, and you can even create a VR game out of the concept. Uh, so yes, there might be some differences um, in uh, how the player will interact with the game, but the core gameplay mechanics can stay the same. So it's more just, let's say, like a specialization on uh, game right. design. Uh, let's say I, I learn how to create games and then I will specialize in uh, mobile games or VR games or PC games or uh, racing games, for example. I, I see this more as a specialization. Okay, cool. Um, was there any other things that you guys wanted to add uh, on, the, on that topic? Is it, um, I think for, for my side, I, I basically don't have any, but is there anything else you guys would like to add on uh, VR and what you yeah. see is coming? <clears throat> sure. I, I, think, I think a big trend that is still starting to pick up um, mostly because of due to cost, is eye tracking. Um, I think eye tracking is going to be a big thing 
for a couple reasons. One, um, there's going to be a big conversation about privacy and determining, you know, what happens with, you know, because, for example, right now today, nobody has any idea what you're looking at when you watch a TV show, when you look at an advertisement, um, when you play a game. They have to go in and do a study. But right. now, with eye tracking, they would be able to ex see exactly where your attention is being paid. So, so attention would be metadata. It would be an input to the game, but also, I mean, if you're playing on the Facebook platform, it would obviously be something they can monetize on. Yeah, so that's a, that's a privacy concern that's going to have to be addressed. But the power of that data is unbelievable because now you can start to understand, like, how are people's interactions with your application, your user interface, your game design, your advertisements. Yes. Um, and also, we can drive these higher resolution headsets like this HP headset or even higher without having to render the entire screen. Just ren render, render where you're, you're looking. looking at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of use uh, of the, the eye tracking. Uh, for, yes, for the technical part, uh, like uh, just reading, rendering the, the part of the screen you're looking at uh, at a high resolution and just uh, blurring the rest because uh, your eyes just don't see clear. It's how uh, eyes works. So yeah. you can um, you can ease the, the the cost of rendering. So make more uh, more uh, complex games with less uh, power. Um, you can also use it, um, integrate it in how you, you you create games, for example, or even applications. Uh, let's say you start looking at something in the game, and the game um, checks that you looked at this, and it makes something happen. Um, I, I have a, um, a very funny example about, about this is about you are in VR, you are talking in an RPG, for example, and you have uh, a, um, a player or a, an NPC in, in front of you. This NPC is a girl. She has a, a very great clever age and you look at her clever age and she just get, gets mad because you're not looking at her eyes or not listening. Look and up at my face. <laughs> my face is up there. <laughs> just a little example but uh, i think with this kind of features we can get uh, really uh, far into the immersion which is the biggest part of uh, vr and uh, i'm sure we'll be able to to make uh, a lot of great stuff uh, with it but yeah there is the the privacy um, point that is very important and um, i'm sure we'll eventually we'll get something like uh, what we have on uh, our smartphone today which is just a list, a list of uh, features we can uh, allow or deny uh, apps let's say i install facebook uh, the facebook app and i don't want it to access my microphone i just say no and it don't access this part so this uh, specific features won't be available uh, but if i want i can enable it and i think in the end we'll have something like this uh, in the vr headset as well and the other thing that's really interesting with eye tracking is also, um, and this is something that Microsoft is implementing, when you put the headset on, it's it knows your irises because it's, it's tracking your irises, and it knows it's you, so it automatically authenticates, so you no longer need a password. So the idea of getting rid of passwords completely mm -hmm. and being able to change the applications and the authorizations and security based on the user that has the headset on. And it gives you absolute privacy. So you can say, okay, I don't want anybody else to see this document. I'll put the headset on. It right. knows it's you. You're authorized to view this document. You watch, you look at the document, you review it. You okay, you put it down and now it's fully secure. Nobody else is ever going to see that document again. It lives in the cloud and the only person who's authorized to see it is you. Is you. Oh, so, for the, sure. you know, the, the, the applications for eye tracking are massive, but the problem is right now it costs, you know, let's say the Vive Pro Eye, uh, it's $1,100 headset and then another 500 bucks gets you the eye, the eye tracking feature. So there's still a little bit of room for improvement on cost, but I think that's a scale issue more than anything. Um, and the truth is, uh, you know, Microsoft has it in the HoloLens 2 and um, HTC has it in the Vive Pro Eye. So we're getting there. Um, but yeah, that's why I think in terms of features, I think the most feature complete headset is the is the HoloLens 2 because it has all these different things that I feel like are what's needed for the future. And, um, you know, it's integrated computing. It's got the eye tracking, hand tracking. It's got a smart, really fast processor in there. It runs Windows. 
Um, so yeah, I think the future is going to look a lot more like a HoloLens too. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks a lot, guys, uh, for um, for joining this uh, for joining this uh, this episode. It's quite a lot of fun to to talk about VR. Hopefully, um, we'll see some great uh, great things coming up later this year. Uh, Angel will sure to check in uh, with you on that. Alex, good luck with all your your development. Uh, it seems that uh, a lot of the heavy lifting for VR is still on the dev side to create those games and create those applications because nothing happens by yeah. magic. Uh, sadly enough, uh, today you can scan your room and pick up virtual objects that have been scanned and then throw them and stuff like that. Maybe very soon, but <laughs> ultimately we'll get there. Um, thanks, Guy. If so, if someone wants to follow you, where can they find you, Angel? Uh, I'm on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it. But Anshul Sog, you'll pretty much find me uh, anywhere. And for you, Alex? Um, I have a Twitter, but I don't use it. Uh, I used to be on Google+, Plus, but... Um, it's dead. <laughs> it's on fire right now. <laughs> uh, so LinkedIn, mainly. LinkedIn. Okay, LinkedIn, Alex friend. We'll put the link in the video description. Uh, for those of you who are watching on Twitch, um, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, you can find the replay, obviously, on YouTube. There will be an audio version as well available as a podcast. If you're listening to this as a podcast or watching the YouTube video, make sure to subscribe. Uh, we'll try to do more of those. I think it's uh, very different from uh, having uh, just uh, me and Isai talking about stuff. It's always interesting of different viewpoints. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for watching, and we'll see you next time.